Thank you for that beautiful welcome, Jason. I won't forget that anytime soon. Um, it's good to be visiting this church at here. I, I hear that I'm visiting today, and I appreciate you putting my name on the back of the bulletin as well, which is, makes me feel very welcome, so thank you. Um, last Friday, I was standing outside Liquorland, and anyway, I was standing outside Liquorland. We just had in Rochdale Estates a new Coles and, and Liquorland open at the end of Gardner Road. And I was doing the Friday afternoon, you know, sort of pre-Sabbath, gluten-free nut meat run to try and get everything, get back home again as per usual. I come out of there and I'm standing literally outside and this woman comes out of the liquor land beside me carrying a huge amount of bottles. And she drops one and she actually does very well. She sort of half sort of catches one of the bottles that sort of drops so it doesn't smash directly on, but then it starts rolling down the road. And it's rolling into the car park, there are cars driving. I just instinctively, you run over and grab it, take it back to her, and she's still struggling to carry all of these things. And I just said to her, I said, do you need a hand? Genuinely, you know, like you are seriously struggling, you're going to drop everything in just a second, we're going to have smashed glass everywhere. She said, that would be lovely. So I helped to carry these bottles to a car, I get home and um, I say to Emma, I really hope none of the 144,000 Adventists who live in Rochdale <laughs> saw me outside this bottle o carrying these bottles of wine to a car. And I thought to myself, that's an interesting place to be in life, where my concern at all of this is what people are going to think of me helping that woman. How did I get to this point in my life? This series that has been going on for the last few weeks has been sort of focused at the younger generations from two different perspectives. You know, last week we had you know, Kim and Haynes talking and preaching an awesome sermon talking to us from that perspective. When I was asked to get involved with this particular one, you know, the question arose in my head, am, am I being asked to talk to the older people in the church or am I one of the old people now talking to the younger people in the church? Um, when I saw Bruce Devil last week, I obviously realized that I was meant to talk to the older generation in the church and try and connect with him. So I'm gonna try and do that today, Bruce. Um, and I really liked last week how Haynes, you know, when he, he got up on stage, and seriously, I was going to do this day, because he started off doing some push-ups, I think. Um, and I thought, okay, let's show these young kids. Um, I can do push-ups. I'll get Emma to stand on my back. We can do this. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to talk to my cardiologist, see if my tablets would support that. So um, I will get around to doing that. So I'm going to play it safe today and not start with push-ups. But seriously, what would I say to myself in my 20s. From where I'm at in life now, what do I say to that boy, that young man in his 20s about God? Not about other things, but what would I say specifically about religion? What about my denomination? What about my church? What would I say to him? Or what would I say to those who are younger now? What about you guys who are in school, college, university, all these different things at the moment. What if you're working, retired, staying at home, wherever you are in life, what have I learnt being brought up a Christian in this church? And for me, the title of the sermon came, which was Hands and Feet. That is what I wanna say to my younger self. Not just because my dear wife is an occupational therapist, uh, and deals with hands all the time, and I hear it, yeah, woo, occupational therapy. Um, no, I, I'm excited about occupational therapy, I just don't know what she does. But <laughs> what would I say, hands and feet, not the now, not the things that are on the end of your limbs, but hands and feet, verb. Something we actually do. I've had quite a few people because when I posted that I was preaching this week 
on um, Facebook, which is one of those ancient social media platforms that the younger kids don't know about, um, I put up a post there and I was talking about the General Conference this week. Anyone, anyone here know that the General Conference of the Adventist Church is, is holding what we would all, you know, have called the session at the moment in the General Conference? Um, that's happening this very week. And I had written about it, as have quite a few of my other friends here, um, talking about some of the decisions that our church is being made. And I don't want to get deep into all of these here, because that's not my job, but in a nutshell, the one I was specifically talking about to answer those people who wrote, was that this week, the general conference session said in a nutshell that four unions across the world, mostly in, in Europe, were going to be warned for non-compliance. It's a word we'll hear in the church a bit, for non-compliance, meaning they weren't following church guidelines in a particular issue. And how were they going to be, I guess, spoken to? How were they going to be warned about this? And then two other union presidents, specifically the presidents, were going to be called out and were to be publicly reprimanded for their unions not following official church guidelines. This is all to do with the, the issue of women's ordination across the world at the moment. It's a tough topic for me because for me, talking about my church, I love it. I'm, I love the administrative side of our church. My family and I love it. I mean, we've sat on um, union, conference executives, aged care boards, school boards, education boards, church boards. You name it. If there's a board, I love being on it. Um, I love the idea of helping to run from behind the scenes sometimes and helping make decisions. I love the administrators we have here in our conference. If you personally get to know the, you know, I guess who I call, and, and take this with a massive grain of salt, I call them the Trinity to their faces. And I don't actually mean that. I know who the Trinity is, but I, I do call Scott, Colin, and Brett the Trinity when we see them. And I love these guys. They are genuinely wonderful people. But why do denominations, why do people within the Christian sphere have these arguments, these quarrels, these disciplinary actions required to help our church move forward and to keep spreading the gospel? That was the question I kept coming back to. What would I tell myself 20 years ago? considering that I am somebody who you've probably known from previous sermons, I'm adverse to one thing in particular in life, and that is change. I don't like change. I, I like the same brands. I'm a brandist. Once I'm into a brand, that is the only brand for me, whether or not it's clothes or golf clubs or whatever it may be. I do not like change. I like the same restaurants. Actually, scrap that. I like the same meals at the same restaurants. I get upset when they change the chef because it may have a different quantity of salt in the meal that I get from the same restaurant. And there are only a few things in my life that I do like changing, which is cars, Lego, and golf clubs. But I'm, I, I'm so loyal to the people I eventually let into my life. I can be a, a tougher nut to crack, but once you're in, I am loyal, loyal, I'm loyal to airlines. I'm loyal to my wives, uh, wife, singular. I am, I have been loyal to every wife I've ever married, thank you very much. But in this case, I would like to say to my 20-year-old self, change can actually be a good thing. What does it mean in this day and age to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Back in my younger days, hey, Peter, wake up. Can I have my water bottle that's behind there? So one, thank you. Back in my younger days, 2003 to be precise, where most of you here were not born, um, I remember a movie came out. Obviously, we didn't go and see it straight away. But by the time it came out on VHS, um, kids ask your parents, uh, it was quite a popular movie, and it was about God. Um, it starred Jennifer Aniston, if you've heard of her, Morgan Freeman, Steve Carell, and Jim Carrey at the time. 
It had the largest opening Memorial Day weekend in history at that point, which was really surprising because it was up against another small movie called The Matrix at the same time, and it actually beat it out. Bruce Almighty was about a man who thought that he could do a... Let me just see if I can get this working. Bruce Almighty is about a man who thought he could do a better job of being the hands and feet of God. Obviously not the Deva kind. Uh, Sorry, hang on. Let's go to the real slide. There we go. That looks a lot like you, Bruce. Huh. Interesting. Anyway. Um... Bruce Almighty is about, okay, let's get, that's hideous, let's move on. Okay, there we go. Bruce Almighty was a movie about a man, Bruce, who thought he could do a better job than God because he wasn't getting his prayers answered. So he thought, what if I was God for the day? Maybe I could do a better job than what he's doing. It was a really interesting concept. Could you do a better job than God does? Because who here has ever had their prayers not answered as far as you're concerned? It's rhetorical. Everybody here at some point in your life will have wanted something that you did not think was given to you, young or old. Bruce thinks, okay, I can do better than that. Just a side note on the movie when I was researching this week too. Most movies in the US, if you're using a telephone number, it's always, you know, 555, which is not an actual real number like system in the US. Uh, In this case, they actually used a real physical phone number when God called Bruce. It went crazy at the time and people with those numbers across different states were getting all these people calling saying, can I talk to God? And in North Carolina, one of those numbers actually went to a church whose head pastor's name was Bruce. I'm just saying, I'm not joking. That is actually, look it up. That's factual. I'm like, you'd be you'd have a pretty tough time. Everyone's calling to talk to Bruce so they can talk to God and and you're answering the phone. But for me, was this the image of hands and feet that I had in my 20s? And it was. Because for me in my 20s, I used to think that I could somehow take the load off Jesus. Maybe somehow I could do something to help him because maybe he needed my help. And so I was in church and I was doing all these different things because I thought I could help God, I may have been wrong on that one. Eloise, could you come up here for a second? Do we have a microphone? The memory, memory verse, but the verse I would like to use today that's the basis. Hello, hello. Is this, could you read that out for me, please? Matthew 25, verse 42 and 43. I was hungry, but you did not give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, but you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, but you did not welcome me. I was naked, but you did not give me any clothes to wear. I was sick and in jail, but you did not take care of me. Matthew 25, verse 24 and 43. It's a scary verse. It's a scary couple of verses of Jesus coming back here and asking some really tough questions. He's looking at a group of people who all believe in him, a group of people who are desperate to go to heaven, desperate to spend eternity with him. And when you read what he's going to ask on his return in this particular story in Matthew here, I don't see anywhere yet that says, how many of the 28 fundamentals can you recite? I can do about 26, but I'm practicing. Um, How many lessons have you taken? How many song services have you led? How many times have you led in, in, you know, a prayer? How many people have you baptized? How many times have you said yes when the nominating committee has asked you to do something, which is really pertinent this week if you get a phone call? this week. Um, None of these questions are asked in this story when Jesus comes back. And they're all massively important. We know that. 
Why is it that the questions he asks of us on his return are so practical? Clothes, food, drink, companionship. Why are these the things that he asks? And it's something I have struggled with for so much of my life. Because my older self realized that although there are so many important things in religion, in our Adventist church, in denominations, in, in following Christ, once you accept, truly accept Jesus, maybe things change. Here's a sentence that I probably wouldn't have expected to say 20 years ago if I was preaching. The person over the last couple of weeks who showed me a picture of Jesus the best to me is a woman called Ellen DeGeneres. Anyone ever heard of Ellen? 20 years ago, younger me probably wouldn't have said that she was my picture of Jesus at this particular point in time, and, and hear me out before you stone me. Um, if you would have seen in the last two weeks, she was photographed and, and videoed at an NFL game. Has anyone seen this in the news the last couple of weeks? So she was photographed, and who was she sitting beside? Anyone remember? George W. Jr. George W. Bush sitting there side by side in an NFL game watching. The backlash was so quick, so immense, because for her, 20 odd years ago, she was the first openly gay Hollywood star to come out. During his presidency, he was one of the leading presidents to try and stop same-sex marriage and went out of his way to add an amendment to the Constitution to stop people doing this. So the uproar across all community was, Ellen, why are you sitting with a man who passionately goes against your belief system? Why would you do that? You were laughing. You actually were enjoying yourself. It seems like the two of you are friends. Tell me this isn't so. So here was her response. I'm friends with George Bush. In fact, I'm friends with a lot of people who don't share the same beliefs that I have. We're all different, and I think that we've forgotten that it's okay that we're all different. Just because I don't agree with someone on everything doesn't mean that I'm not going to be friends with them. When I say, and she says this at the end of her show, The Ellen Show, every day, when I say be kind to one another, I don't only mean people that think the same way that you do. I mean be kind to everyone. For me, that statement, for me, maybe not for you, but for me, that statement encompasses so much of how I now see Jesus. Somebody who can look past and beyond so many different things in our lives, mistakes, failures, things that we do wrong to this day. But when she says, when I say be kind to everyone, I don't just mean be kind to those who think the same as you. That is exactly the kind of Jesus I see in the Gospels coming down and talking with all these people. What do we, you, I, what do we get bogged down in, in this life right now? This older version of me now what do I get bogged down in with life, with, with my religion, with my experience with Jesus, why we're all in church today? What stops you having that relationship with him? Maybe nothing. Maybe you guys have it all together and you've got this great relationship with, with Jesus, with Christ, and things are just fantastic for you. Maybe not. Because a lot of the things we get bogged down at bogged down in here in life are things that cause division and hatred and lots of these different things. And don't get me wrong, Jesus did exactly all of those things. When he came down, was there division? Absolutely. Was there hatred going around in Jesus' time? Absolutely. But what did he come for? A few words of why you think Jesus came. What was his role on earth here? What was his ministry to different people? Any words? Not rhetorical. Any words? Peace. Sorry, speak up. Healing. The sa forgiveness. Relationships. Love. 
All these different things are the words that he used when he came down here. He came to befriend the tax collectors, the poor old tax collectors. Not because they were collecting tax, but because they, of who they were in society, seen as worthy like a dog to the Jewish people. If you were a Jewish tax collector like Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, you were the lowest of lows. Who else does Jesus call out? He calls out the lepers, the sick, the demon-possessed, the children. Again, somebody in society at the time who was seen as so unimportant. Children were worthless until they could farm, produce kids, get a dowry, whatever they might be doing, they really didn't have much value in society. They are the people he kept coming down and using the Gentiles, the Samaritans, anyone other than a Jew. And then most of the times that he actually spoke about the Jews, think of some stories that Jesus spoke about when a Jewish person was involved in the story. Rich young ruler. What about the good Samaritan and the Jewish leaders coming past? Think of all the stories that he included in Jews and so many of them are negative. Why? Why? Because the people at the time were simply not getting why he was here. He wasn't here to create their perfect utopian world where the Jewish people were going to live forever, rule forever and conquer the Romans. He came here to accept all, period. It didn't matter who you were, how low down you were, how high up you were. We were all equal. So what scares me is that when he returns and he's asking about how my relationship with him has changed me, it gets scary. Because the other verse, Matthew 25, 35 and 36, I think, 35 and 36, I'll put it up on the screen here, is so similar to the one Eloise just read out. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me in. And when I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. When I was sick, you took care of me. And when I was in jail, you visited me. But to those who hadn't been touched in their relationship with Jesus, to those who didn't have this great relationship with him, we get back to that verse that she read out, which is 42 and 43, and just see how similar it is. I was hungry, but you did not give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, but you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. I was naked, no clothes. I was in jail and sick, and you did not take care of me. And what gets even scarier for me in this whole passage in Matthew here is the response from the people who he's talking to. So it doesn't matter which camp you're in, sheep or goats here, these are the two things he's just said to you, to me. And you're listening to one of these two conversations that Jesus is having. And here is the reply that we give back. 37 and 39. For the people who have this great relationship with Jesus, they say, when did we give you something to eat or drink? When? When did we welcome you as a stranger? When did we give you clothes to wear? Or when did we visit you while you were sick or in jail? And yet the other group of people, so similar once again, Lord, when did we fail to help you when you were hungry? or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in jail. Both groups of people, doesn't matter which side you're on, you're going to question Jesus and go, when? We missed it. We completely missed you being here with us. Completely. And both groups of people are going to ask the question of, When did we help you or when did we miss helping you? When did we see you? When did we not see you? When did we not visit you? When did we visit you? We have no idea. And then the answer comes from Jesus. Matthew 25, 45 and 40. 
both up on the screen at the same time here. Whenever you fail to help any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you failed to do it for me. Or if you're in the other group, whenever you did it for any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did it for me. This isn't about works. I'm not trying to preach about all the things you've got to go out and do this afternoon to try and, you know, get to heaven. Um, You don't have to go around looking for naked people. You don't have to do all these different things this afternoon to try and get some brownie points to get to heaven. It's about what happens when you're in that relationship. Because as humans, one thing I've seen in myself and my friends is that when we, we personally, are forgiven, are loved, are nurtured, are cherished, are looked after, what is your natural instinct and response back? You're going to give it back in spades. When you are all of those things and somebody treats you in that way, as Jesus is treating us, then by your fruits you shall be known. If you haven't been touched by a relationship in a real way, if the relationship that you're in with Jesus or with somebody else here and you don't have that connection, (coughs) what do you give back in that relationship? If you haven't felt nurtured, cherished, loved, respected, whatever it may be, what do you give back? These are the questions Jesus are asking to know how we're going to respond to everything he has given us. For me, I was at the florist the other day. I go there regularly. Um, And I bought a really large bunch of flowers for Emma. And the response from the florist is exactly what you're thinking right now. What'd you do wrong? In my head, I'm like, well, I really don't have much time um, to go through all of this, but, you know... I would just like to buy this this bunch of flowers, please. And for me, there are two reasons why I would buy flowers. What, What are the two reasons you would possibly buy flowers for your wife, if you are a guy here? And for any of you girls who often buy flowers for your husbands, same deal applies, we are equal. Um, but please don't buy me flowers. Um, a birthday? Absolutely. What are some of the other reasons you might buy flowers? Just because you love her. Any other reason? So birthdays and because you love her. Any other reason you've ever bought flowers in your life? Anniversaries? Anniversaries? What? A new baby? There are so many different reasons why we would buy flowers. But it boils down to one of two things. You're either buying them because you love and cherish that person and want them to know for whatever reason, an anniversary, for pushing out a small watermelon, um, or you're buying it because you need them to love you, because you need some uh, forgiveness in life. And either way, you're buying these flowers. One is trying to earn favor from her, and one is trying to let them know how much you cherish them. Max, when was the last time you bought flowers? Okay, hang on, this is going to take a while. Um, (laughs) When we buy these things for somebody, a gift of genuine love and acceptance, we are hopefully trying to let that person know that we care deeply for them or that we have messed up and we really are trying to smooth over a few uh, bumps here and we need a little bit of help. So I guess for me, as I looked back at the session that's been going on this week, I started asking myself when I was talking to some friends, what would Jesus' reaction be? And I'm not just having a go at our church here at all, but across Christianity in general. But if he came down to our session this week and saw the division that we're having within our church at the moment, and I can't comment on the theological reasons behind women's ordination or anything, I am not trained. I have not been to the great Avondale College or Andrews University or anywhere to be able to talk on such things. 
But what strikes me as odd as a lay person within the church is that we seem to be dividing our church in this one particular instance over who is allowed to go and spread the gospel of Jesus. And I know it's much deeper than that, but from face value, are we truly saying that half of the people in our denomination are not authorized to do that? These are questions I'm grappling with at the moment. We obviously have a very different church here. I mean, we've just had, you know, Cara, Annalise, Caitlin come through here and minister with us and to us. I love our church because I see things like uh, Reese, Red Frogs, a non-Adventist startup, actually from City Point Church, going down and helping every week they get together with university people to help them through life and just be friends with them. Go to schoolies coming up very soon and literally clean vomit off the floor. Walk people home because they're sick or because they're scared and they need safety. Clean apartments, whatever it is they may do, they go out. They're not doing it to get baptisms into our church out of interest. They're not doing it so at the end of the month they can look down and go, sweet, six new converts, good work me. They do it to be the hands and feet of him. There's no prerequisites to help. We have a church who has, I believe, one of the best Adras going around at Adra Logan. You talk about being hands and feet, physically feeding the hungry, literally feeding the hungry, literally clothing those who can't get clothes. Last week, you would have seen a, um, the video. Um, remember him, Tyson? Andre was talking on this video, Andre Van Ransburg was talking about him. And every time that I've gone through this story this week, I have lost it, so I'm going to try and hold on here today. But my younger 20-year-old self sees Tyson walk into my church, and what's my first reaction? The problem for me is my first reaction is, that's a lot of tattoos. My first reaction might be, well, he's not wearing a suit. Or my first reaction might be, anything about his appearance. You move to older me, and I look at somebody like Tyson and see his story, read his story over and over again. And I look at Tyson now, 20 years on, as somebody who appears to me like Jesus. He is the Jesus that would walk into my church now, truly. A man who gives up whatever he has or has not in his life to help other people. Who walks in and could easily just walk past me and one day I get questioned by Jesus saying, hey, where were you when I came to your church and sat down the front? Why did you, Lauren, not come and say hello to me? Jesus, I please... If I had seen you walk into Springwood in your robe and your long beard looking very Arab-like, I would have come and said hello to you. I would have recognized you as Jesus. And he would turn to me and say, Lauren, I never came dressed like that. I came one day and I called myself Tyson. And I sat down there and I showed you what it was like to be my hands and feet. I went out and helped those who needed help. Where were you, Lauren? Oh, God, I mean, Jesus, I, I, a new episode of Survivor had dropped and I needed to catch up on it because I, it, it helps me unwind. I, I needed my TV that afternoon. Whatever it is that's your drug of choice. You can't earn his love and forgiveness, which we know. That's the gift. But you sure can show 
his love and forgiveness to those around you. So often we even think that we're the ones doing it right. We are so caught up in our own lives in thinking that we are trying our very best. And so many times we are. But we were talking in Sabbath school this morning about the disciples, these blessed 12 apostles. How many times were they told something by Jesus? (coughs) Excuse me. Told something by Jesus, something very clear. And within chapters after that, they're doing exactly the same thing again. Surely you've seen that before and you've gone, how do these disciples honestly not get it? They are literally walking with Jesus day by day. They are cleaning with him. They are toileting with him. They are eating with him. They are doing everything with Jesus. And they still can't see who he really is. Because we are blinded so often by who we are rather than who he is. I'm going to finish up. I want to finish on this poem. It's a very famous poem. And it involves two of my favorite things in the world, cookies and travel. It was written by Valerie Cox, and it says, A woman who was waiting in an airport one night with several long hours before her next flight. She hunted for books in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies and found a place to stop. She was so engrossed in her own book, but happened to see that the man beside her as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag in between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a big scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock as the gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I would blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. With only one left, she wondered what would he do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy's got some nerve and he's also so rude. Why, he didn't even show me any gratitude. She couldn't remember ever being so appalled and sighed with relief when her flight was finally called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane, she sank in a chair, sorry, in a seat. Then she sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached into her baggage, she gasped with surprise, for there was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If mine are here, she moaned in despair, the others were his and he was trying to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. The younger me often thought I may have been the hands and feet of Jesus. And I would have answered, Lord, when did I not do these things for you? When? Please tell me, because I'm pretty certain I did. I don't want to be that person who helps a woman carry a bottle to a car and then go, oh, please, please let no one have seen me. Literally this week, I've just been scanning social media, waiting for the photos to drop, resignation letter to Kendall in place, going, I'm out of here, I'm done, I'm sorry. But the older me wants to be able to look back when Jesus asks me that question. And I want to be able to say to him, Lord, when did I do those things for you? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your absolute awesomeness, your gifts, your forgiveness, your love, your, the cherishing that you do for us. Thank you that we have the ability to accept this gift, to become one of your children, and help us to remember that being your hands and feet is to everyone, to all and to any. And help us be able to answer you when you come back and say, where were you? We want to be able to say, Jesus, when did we? How did we? I I can't remember stepping out of my way to helping you, God. And you will look down and say, when you did it to the least, to the least 
the most insignificant people. You did it to me, Lauren. That's my prayer. Amen.